Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. Now, obviously, today's talk is purely for academic interest. Never take any medicines or stop take any, any medicines that your doctor has prescribed based on what you hear here. But the first clip is with a Mr. Joe Rogan and it features Dr. Mark Gordon. Let's listen to that clip now. I think you'll find it interesting. You shouldn't talk about that publicly. No, I should not. Ivermectin. Yeah, ivermectin. Horrible shits. Really, you you can talk about it now. Oh, good. Now, uh, you know, people are taking it. Yeah. I I think I sent you the ivermectin paper with ivermectin from Bendazole. Mm -hmm. I have a 76-year-old veteran who was diagnosed with a Gleason 7. You know, Gleason is the grade of cancer of the prostate. And it was a Gleason 7. He went on 12 milligrams of ivermectin every day for eight weeks, and at 12 weeks, he got a PET scan done, a special PET scan done, looking at um, abnormalities in the prostate. They couldn't find anything. That's amazing. And his PSA, prostatic specific antigen, when when his initial one with the cancer was Uh, 12.6, he's now at 5.3. Well, there you go. Now, um, the second clip is, again, from Mr. Joe Rogan uh, in conversation with a Mr. Mel... Gibson, let's listen to what happened to three of Mr. Gibson's friends. I'll tell you a good story. Okay. I have three friends. All three of them had stage four cancer. All three of them don't have cancer right now at all. And they had some serious stuff going on. And what did they take? Jesus. They took some, what you've heard they've taken. Ivermectin, fenbendazole. And fenbendazole. Yeah, That's yeah. Tough. I'm hearing that a lot. They there's, drank hydrochloride, something or other. There's studies on that there's, now where people have proven that people are drinking stu- methylene yeah. blue and stuff like. That. Yeah, methylene blue, which was a fabric dye. Yeah, yeah, it was a textile dye, and now they find out it has profound effects on your mitochondria. Yep. Yeah, this stuff works, man. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that does work, which is very strange mm-hmm. because. Again, it's profit. When you pe- when you hear about things that are demonized and that, are, that turn out to be effective, you always wonder, well, what is going on here? Mm-hmm. How is how is our medical institutions? How have they failed us so that things that do cure you are not promoted because they're not profitable? Well, it's clearly true to say there's a lot of interest, and increasing interest on repurposed drugs. Drugs are often out of patent, remarkably inexpensive, with potential wider therapeutic applications than their original uh, indications. Now, the problem is there's a real lack of trial data on this. And we, we, we know this is true because clinical trials are expensive and people aren't going to spend a lot of money on trials. But I believe that President Trump is going to reintroduce right to try. So people with diseases like cancer or terminal diseases will have a right to try a new drug uh, or a repurposed drug. And this means that they should be available on prescription fairly soon in the United States. And this means we can collect very detailed, ongoing, longitudinal, prospective data to allow us to adjudicate definitively on efficacy, even without potentially a randomised double-blind controlled trial. Now, I do know a few people that might be working in the new administration uh, under Mr Kennedy, we hope, and uh, I am making some suggestions for research ideas to them. Uh, One is the potential for repurposed drugs to have a properly funded clinical trial, a trial that's not funded by Big Pharma. And that would yield absolutely fascinating results, but we don't know if that's going to happen. But there's other ways we can collect data. In the meantime, I want to talk to you about this, which has grabbed my attention. This is from the medical advisor, exploring the anti-cancer potential of fenbendazole or fenben. Anecdotal case reports and emerging evidence 2025. Now, straight away, we're frustrated by the anecdotal nature of this, but as I say, no one is prepared to cough up the 10, 20 million dollars for a large-scale randomised controlled trial, unless it comes under the new administration in the States, as, as we say. Otherwise, it's probably not going to happen. But the potential for collecting a lot of data is absolutely there already. Now, let's just look at what this study is about. It's a compilation of 80 case controlled reports, 80 case reports across various cancer types. 
uh, breast, lung, colorectal, pancreatic cancers are included. While these anecdotal accounts suggest potential anti-cancer effects of fenbendazole, the lack of controlled clinical, tri clinical trials necessitates caution. So I can't emphasize enough, don't take any drugs based on what you hear here. Only take drugs that are given to you by your registered medical uh, prescriber. This is for academic interest, but I am also hoping it's going to stimulate new research, which is uh, also massively important. So controlled clinical trials, not going to happen. I wouldn't have thought because you can't make money out of repurposed drugs unless government takes it on. Healthcare professionals should be consulted before considering a fenbendazole as a treatment option. Now, fenbendazole, in the UK at least, and I think it's true in the States, is not actually licensed for human use. There's a similar drug called mubendazole, but this doesn't alter the fact that people are taking it. Now, I make no comment on that. I simply report that people are taking it. Uh, there's been growing popularity in recent years of the use of fenben uh, as a single agent or supplementary therapeutic. And we know that uh, drugs like fenbendazole, mubendazole and ivermectin are well tolerated by the vast majority of individuals, a very low side effect profile. All drugs have adverse events, of course, uh, but, but these less than other drugs that could be mentioned. Now, the method that they use here, uh, reports were categorised by cancer type and outcomes are assessed based on self-reported measures. Now, obviously, this is a limitation. But we've uh, got similar data that we'll show you in a minute from uh, this channel as well. Uh, tumour regression, uh, remission status and overall survival, which of course is, is wonderful to promote survival if that is the case. These findings, while compelling, according to this article, must be interpreted cautiously due to the inherent limitations of the data source. And again, the frustrations are there. But this qualitative well, I think this is a set, I, I would call this qualitative data essentially, but that shows where the quantitative data should be done, where it should be collected. And we're not short of statisticians, as we've said many times, who can uh, analyse this material once we get the data. Now, um, breast cancer. There was eight cases of breast cancer reported outcomes such as tumour shrinkage or remission. Wonderful news. The majority of these cases involved early to moderate stage disease with some patients combining fenbendazole with standard treatments. Interesting that the fenbendazole could be combined with standard treatments like chemotherapy and hormone therapy or hormone suppression therapy indeed. One notable case involved a patient with metastatic, so it spread all over the place or spread to other sites at least, triple negative uh, breast cancer achieving remission after six months on fenbendazole. Triple negative means that there's not various antigens on the surface. It can be associated with the, um, the BRCA gene, which greatly predisposes to breast and ovarian cancer. And it often it's often the cancer in younger people. I think it's about 15% of cancers from memory, but often those under 40. So... If we can cure this, that would be wonderful because we're talking about young women and a few young men. In fact, indeed. Um, now, a bit confusing alongside a ketogenic diet and uh, immune supportive treatment. So this is why we need trials. So we've got people here that are taking fenbendazole and traditional treatments and immunosupportive treatments and sometimes a ketogenic diet. So how do we tease out between the two? Well, of course, in a clinical trial, you would say, well, you lot take Fenben alone, you lot take Fenben and conventional therapy, you lot take Fenben and ketogenic diet, you lot take ketogenic diet on its own, you would isolate them. But if we can't do a clinical trial, and, and the efficacy of that would be very questionable, actually, um, what we need to do is people, if, if, who knows, half a million people in the United States decide to try this option when they're given the right to try, um, then we'll hopefully have some people who do take fenbendazole without a ketogenic diet. We'll have some people who take fenbendazole with a ketogenic diet. We'll have some people who take fenbendazole with a no drug like ivermectin. We'll have some people who take fenbendazole with traditional treatments or without traditional treatments. So in other words, you'll have self-generating cohorts here that can be isolated as long as that data is prospectively collected. And, and is not, this wouldn't be difficult to do. This can be done. So these can be teased apart, hopefully, in the next few years, uh, if people choose these options uh, under right to try uh, rules, which I believe are going to be coming back in the United States. Because people that are 
got a terminal disease anyway, that are dying anyway. To me, it is unconscionable not to allow them to try what treatment they would like to try. Anyway, so that, that is all teasable, outable potentially in the future. Now, in this study of 80 respondents, lung cancer, nine cases highlighted improved survival rates and tumour regression. Lung cancer, of course, has got an appalling prognosis. Appalling prognosis. I remember when I was a young theatre staff nurse, I'd just started in theatre. And the consultant came across from, from Newcastle to, to where I work. And uh, we did these, in those days, it was rigid bronchoscopy. And he looked down and said, oh, they've, they've got lung cancer. And I expected him to say, well, we can do this, that and the other. And he said, well, the, the prognosis is essentially non-existent. And I was taken aback uh, by, by what couldn't be done. I what an appalling prognosis. Now, of course, things have moved on since then. Uh, but still, lung cancer has a... A difficult prognosis, shall we say, without going into too much uh, detail. Now, um, one patient with advanced, I think this is non-small cell lung carcinoma, <laughs> a lot of anachronisms in this, uh, demonstrated significant tumour shrinkage within three months of incorporating fenbendazole <coughs> alongside a more traditional treatment checkpoint inhibitors. Colorectal cancer, nine patients uh, reported tumour reduction, uh, remission, or disease stabilisation. Wonderful news. And again, particularly striking outcomes. Um, one of the most striking outcomes from a patient with stage 4 colorectal cancer achieving no evidence of disease status after integrating Fenben with conventional therapies and dietary modifications. And again, was it this synergistic effect? Again, when we, if we have larger scale numbers with people opting for different treatment options, people are essentially selecting what group they're going to go into. I know there's questions there with randomization, but if the numbers are big enough, I'm sure we can take that into account. Then we can unpick what it is about these particular individuals that give such a good outcome. You get the feeling there's a real treasure trove of data here just waiting to be tapped. Pancreatic cancer, again, appalling outcomes normally. Eight cases involve pancreatic cancer and aggressive malignancy with limited treatment options. Outcome would generally less pronounced than other cancers. Unfortunately, other types of cancer reporting benefit: uh, melanoma, prostate cancer, glioblastoma in the in the head, in the brain, ovarian cancer. Mixed outcomes. Some patients indicate significant clinical improvement, including reduced tumor markers and uh, alleviated symptoms. Now, the combined therapies, as we've said, um, making the specific um, specific effects of a particular arm of the intervention, intervention difficult to adjudicate, but this could be done with larger numbers if data is collected, as is the same with supportive therapy. I mean, many patients used, uh, I mean, Professor Dalglish told us how essential vitamin D status is to a wide range of cancer treatments. Vitamin C, of course, goes all the way back to Linus Pauling. Zinc, curcumin, um, are the synergistic effects. And um, there could well be synergistic effects or with some treatments are there inhibitory effects so taking a particular supplement could that potentially inhibit the action of fenbendazole we don't know this is why we need to collect the data and, and may well be collecting the data in the next few years consistency and dosage regular and sustained use of fenbendazole appeared to correlate with better reported outcomes Dosage range from 2 to 2 milligrams, a standard veterinary dose, to 1 gram per day, depending on individual protocols. But of course, this is just for academic interest. Don't take anything based on what we say here. Limitations of this study, small sample size, self-reported data, concurrent therapies, as we've mentioned. Now, potential mechanisms of action here. Is this ludicrous? Well, no, there are real potential mechanisms of action with ivermectin and fenbendazole and mabendazole in cancer. There are potential mechanisms of action. Pharmacodynamic effects. Um, so uh, microtubule disruption. So what hap what's happening here is when a, cell, when a cell divides, if you have a cell there that's going to divide, um, the nuclear material, will, will, the, the nucleus in the middle will divide divide into two and you'll get one going to this side and one going to this side with the individual chromosomes but the chromosomes are all sort of towed as it were by by these microtubules that tow them into their half of the cell to cause the 
to cause the, the division. So if these microtubules uh, aren't forming in a cancer cell, the cancer cell can't divide. So microtubule disruption makes perfect sense. Metabolic effects, inhibiting glucose. Um, like all cells, cancer cells need energy. Glucose is the common energy source of cells. So you inhibit the ability of the cell to use glucose. It's a bit like starving it, isn't it? <coughs> Which is good. Immune modulation, more speculative, um, but potential, potentially. Consistency of positive outcomes across diverse cancer types suggests a potential biological effects that merits further investigation. We agree. The pattern of case reports also suggests that fenbendazole may inhibit broad spectrum anti-cancer properties. What an intriguing possibility. Uh, it is imperative that patients consult healthcare professionals before considering fenbendazole as a treatment option. I'm saying that as a direct quote from the text. And the future directions, <coughs> control clinical trials, probably only if the government takes it on. Um, which is, of course, is terrible. We need a complete rethink of the selectivity of medical topics which are researched and the selectivity of medical topics which are ignored. Mechanism studies, always good to know what the heck is going on. Uh, combination therapy research, as we've said. The consistency of anecdotal outcomes Supported by plausible preclinical mechanisms, positions fenbendazole as a promising candidate for future investigation in oncology. Of course, we would need fenbendazole to be officially approved for human use as well. So the drug regulatory agencies can look at that. Uh, mabendazole is very similar. It ends in azole. And we know that um, ivermectin can have uh, similar anecdotal reports about it. And in fact, um, just to show you on a previous video, I just compiled a few of your reports that we have here. These are all, I'm going to paste these below and put the link to the video. But these are all reports from you um, that you have given me on pre feedback from previous videos. Uh, again, someone should do a proper qualitative evaluation of this. But lots of positive reports about human lives potentially saved animal lives uh, potentially saved and uh, that was just a few that I picked out for a, a feedback video which I say I will put the link to so um, I'll put I'll put the uh, I'll put as many of those in the comments as I can uh, leave me comments about your own experience we are accumulating anecdotal evidence uh, let's hope that this is soon transposed into firm quantitative data and that regulatory agencies around the world uh, stay bang up to date with the latest data to save lives from uh, people dying of cancer. But it's not only saving the life. Cancer can be a painful death as well. The amount of human pain, suffering and death, if this is demonstrated to be efficacious, that this can prevent, is immense. Can be done. And as I've said before, in my view, the research should be done. We'll leave it there. Thanks to Joe Rogan and uh, his uh, guests as well. Bye for now.